One of the features that we had was we had um, just a single rock bar. And the idea behind the rock bar was to take advantage of a dolerite dike that we had, which is a really erosion resistant section of rock. The concern that we had was if we had a very large event early on, you would get these high velocities because you don't have the trees established yet. So you, your roughness is quite low. Hi, I'm Cray with the International Water Training Institute. On behalf of the Australian Water School, welcome to today's webinar, which is the first in a new series on mine water management. Now, today we're going to be highlighting the critical areas where mining meets waterways. So the focus may be on the surface water that you can see, but as we'll discover during the session, there are some equally significant issues in the water table below the ground that's perhaps less visible. Now, before we begin, let's first welcome each of you joining us today. We've had almost a thousand people register for this webinar and looking at the spread, it is a truly global audience. Now, usually our presenters are spread around the world as well, but today all three of us are joining you from the Wild West here in Perth, Western Australia, where mining is very prevalent and where we tend to run into some pretty significant waterways as well in our land of droughts and flooding rains, as Australia is known. Um, that can cause not just environmental, but also safety concerns. Um, today we'll be joined by Ian and Duncan who together bring balance to the force with their respective uh, perspectives and deep expertise on surface water and groundwater alike. And we hope you get to see some of that elusive groundwater surface water interaction uh, during our panel discussion. Now, for a quick plug, though, before we bring our speakers on here at the Australian Water School, we do like to seek that optimal balance between surface water and groundwater. So in that light, I wanted to quickly mention a couple of upcoming courses. You'll see links to these at the end and in the YouTube description and in the chat line. Uh, but last year, we put together a series of courses on hydrology and hydraulics essentials. It covered some of the first principles buried in the black box of a lot of the surface water software courses that we provide. Uh, so we just wanted to concisely put all of these prerequisite fundamentals for running models in one easy to reach place with interactive exercises and practical examples that can help the learning process. Now that set of courses is available for anyone to register for and to complete at your own pace with on-demand viewing, uh, just through the website, as you can see here. Um, and we're gonna be taking the same approach now with Groundwater Essentials. And that's a course that is starting this week. So this is your last chance under the live training here to uh, register for this course and get live interaction with the instructors from around the world um, who are very excited to bring you some engaging content that's gonna help shed some light on the background knowledge that you might need, not just in groundwater modeling, but in incorporating incorporating hydrogeology into the boundary conditions of your surface water model as well. So this course is not just for groundwater people. Um, as you'll see in today's session, there are a lot of places where you just can't be that binary. Um, surface water experts need to understand groundwater principles and vice versa. And we'd encourage both sides of the fence to sign up for these courses and gain a better understanding of what lies on the other side of the water table. So we hope to see you in that class. And with that out of the way, let's finally have Ian and Duncan turn their cameras on. And if you could tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, tell us where you're joining us from today and how you got to where you're at now in your career. So let's start with Ian and then over to Duncan. Yeah, thanks, Cray. So my name's Ian Ree. Um, my background is in water engineering. I studied in Perth at UWA, uh, environmental engineering, and Worked at the Water Corporation here for a few years and then went on to consulting, um, worked with Duncan actually for quite a long time at Aquaterra. And I've been with BHP for 10 years now and my role here is Superintendent of Water Engineering. So I do a mix of um, pipelines and pump design for our dewatering and water supply systems and um, looking after the planning of our surface water assets as well. So our creek and river diversions and making sure that our, creek, our pits stay nice and dry when we have cyclones coming over the top of them, as is prone to happen. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Duncan, you want to give us a quick introduction, tell us a little bit about your career, um, how you got to where you are, and where you're coming to us from this morning. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Ian. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, my name is Duncan Storey. Uh, I'm a hydrogeologist working here in Perth. I'm originally from the UK, where I did my education, uh, master's degree at the University of Newcastle. Um, been in Perth for about 25 years and working pretty much ex exclusively for the mining industry over that time. Um, so 25 years worth of experience in mining groundwater. Uh, as Ian said, we worked together uh, at a company called Aquaterra uh, for quite a few years, and um, I continued to work with BHP in a cons uh, consulting capacity uh, over that period of time. 
Excellent. Now, thanks to the attendees um, who filled out uh, the pre-webinar questions. Uh, we'll just have a quick look at those, um, see where everybody's coming to us from today, um, and see how we're split between groundwater and surface water. It looks like the bulk uh, have, of the attendees have come from a surface water background, some with both, and so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good uh, showing there. Um, but it does show us that there's going to be some interest in some potentially some future uh, webinars that we'll do on uh, focused on groundwater. Now, uh, uh, looks like there are quite a few uh, attendees, maybe 60% or so, with uh, experience in the mining sector directly, and then about 40% with no experience in the mining sector. We hope to be able to cater to both. Um, those who are new to it, I'll uh, give you a bit of an introduction. Those who have been experienced uh, with it for a while, maybe we can uh, add some insights uh, on the surface water impacts. Now, this is a uh, you know uh, the first, I think, of a series of webinars, but uh, this depends on your input. And so uh, thanks for filling out that poll question. It looks like there's a pretty even split in the uh, topics that everybody's interested in hearing about. Um, do give us some feedback um, and some suggestions for uh, potential presenters and presentations and technical uh, papers that you might have seen where we can bring the most engaging presenters we can on for you and present on some of these topics like tailings dam failures or mine dewatering. Uh, some of those things, uh, you know, mines can have a significant impact on the uh, on water courses, both uh, surface water and on aquifers. And so we want to make sure that uh, you know we're applying the best technology we can, uh, the best modeling software, and giving you the tools uh, and uh, insights that we uh, you know we can pass along to you uh, to you know, help, help you in your uh, water professional careers. Uh, most of our subscribers are uh, in the water profession and um, we like to, uh, you know, uh, help promote uh, any um, any of the current uh, standards of practice that we can. So with that, um, Ian, if you want to start uh, sharing your screen um, and at the end, what we'll do is we'll come back on for a panel discussion. Uh, please keep, uh, the Q&A questions coming because what usually happens with this is we get a bunch of Q&A questions right toward the end and then we don't have time to answer them. If you get your Q&A questions in now while Ian's talking, um, Duncan will help answer those in the background and then we'll have some good questions to discuss uh, when Ian's done with his uh, with his presentation. So I can see that screen just fine. Um, thanks for sharing that, uh, Ian. Uh, over to you and we'll come back on when you're done. Thanks. All right. Thanks a lot, Cray. Um, thanks for the introduction and good morning, everyone. So before I get into the presentation, one thing that I hope you'll notice throughout the talk is I've tried to be very open about the work that we're doing and where we're doing it. Uh, even in, in locations, I've got the GPS coordinates so um, people can look up and verify the work that we're doing. Um, but that's deliberate in that um, both myself and BHP are very much on a continuous improvement journey. And um, by doing this talk, I'm hoping not only to share the work that we're doing, but um, to test our approach and hear other opinions that might help us to, to learn as well. Um, so I'm going to talk about why do we need to divert creeks and rivers, um, how BHP Iron Ore thinks about diversions which are operational only versus diversions which are going to be around over closure timeframes, some of our efforts to minimise reduction in catchment areas, the concept of creek capture, how do we select a design event, um, design event versus design life, how are those two concepts different? Some design considerations, including longitudinal slope and revegetation. And then really the second half of the presentation is running through a large diversion, which we have completed and the thinking behind it. Um, and it includes a, a four minute drone flyover of that diversion. So whereabouts in the world are we? So we're operating in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. So it is the world's largest iron ore producing region. Uh, if you're dialing in from Asia, it's very likely that the reinforcement in your house or, or office is actually made from iron ore that's come from the Pilbara. And if you're dialing in from somewhere else, it's very likely that you've at some stage in your life purchased something that's made from in Asia from Australian iron ore. So it's probably a little piece of Pilbara somewhere floating around in your house. Um, elevation typically ranges from 500 to 1,000 metres above sea level. Um, rainfall is generally around 350 millimetres per year, uh, generally comes mostly in the summer summer months um, through thunderstorms and cyclones. It is a hard rock environment, so um, some of these learnings might not be so applicable to a more alluvial environments. Um, and stream flow is typically around two to three stream flow events a year for a day or two, the larger river systems can flow for periods of months. 
Okay, so why do we need to divert creeks? So here's an example where we have a small creek which is coming through. This light blue line is its original flow path, reaches the larger creek system. Um, but there's a deposit of iron ore in through here that we wanted to get access to. So we've constructed a bund, an upstream bund that stops the water fl from flowing into the pit area. And then we've constructed a channel around to the west, takes that water into the larger creek. And then we've also got a larger downstream bund to stop that main creek from flooding into the pit. So really it's just to get access to resources which otherwise are constrained by the creek. But it's worth calling out that sometimes it's not worth doing that diversion. So here's an example at our Jimble Bar mine called Inawali Pool. So we actually had approvals to mine this area. Um, the ore runs directly underneath the, the pool. Um, but in 2018, we decided not to mine this area due to the environmental and heritage values there. And so that resulted in a NPV reduction of US $70 million. Um, and it required us to um, re-release our reserves, uh, our reserve numbers to the Australian and New York Stock Exchanges. Um, but we did that because we didn't think it was the right thing to do to mine this area. We could have diverted the creek around it and continued the water flow path downstream, but um, the geology and topography are quite unique here and we wouldn't have been able to re-establish a pool like this. So operational versus closure designs. Um, so operational designs are pretty easy, really. Um, so you really just determine what the hydrology is and then you can run some pretty simple hydraulic models and determine what cross section you need. Um, and then you can go out and construct that drain. So really it's just an engineering approach and you don't need to consider geomorphology or the ecology. Um, so you can see in this example here, we've essentially just got a trapezoidal channel with a low flow channel down the bottom. Um, but there's not a lot of effort has been gone into to create a system which will evolve to a natural creek system. And, um, and this is only a temporary diversion, so it didn't warrant that effort. When you start to move into closure designs, one of the key differences is that geomorphology input is required and you need to start thinking a lot more broadly. So consider the slope, the stream power, how sediment is going to move through the system, what the size of the sediment is that you have and, and how does that compare to what the creek wants to move, what the lateral migration of the system is going to be, um, do you have any risks of creek capture and what's the shallow aquifer uh, in the system. And if you can get all the physical properties correct, then the ecology will come after. So that's really one of the keys. You get the physical properties correct and then nature will come and take over. It's impossible to do the reverse. So one of the largest post-closure impacts that mining has is through loss of catchment. And it can be a dramatic impact such as creek capture, um, which I'll talk to in a couple of slides, but it can also be the cumulative impact of a number of smaller losses. So in this table here, I've just tried to show some of the forms of impacts. How do we get reduction in catchment area and then BHP iron ore's approach to reducing that impact. So with creek capture, we, um, we backfill the pits above the creek invert so that you don't get a, a, potential, um, a potential change in energy between the base of the pit and the creek. Um, we can use spillways where we do have competent rock to limit the extreme flows coming down the creek. Open pits themselves are often unavoidable. Um, so they often do result in a loss of catchment area. Uh, our external or X pit OSAs, so OSAs is an overburdened storage area or a waste dump. Um, so they're designed to maximize stability. And so they're deliberately designed to not shed any water. Um, which is great in making sure that they don't erode away, um, but it does mean that they result in a reduction in catchment area. So we can try and reduce those by putting as much of our waste in pit as possible. The blocking of small creeks by OSAs, so we can leave gaps in the OSAs to allow the drainage to pass through them. And then interception of minor creeks by pits. So there's a couple of options there. We can either divert the creek around the pit or we can re-establish the creek over a backfill pit. And I'll show an example of that. So this is at our Yandy mine. 
and we have a catchment of 30 square kilometres. Um, so we're looking downstream here. And so you can see the pit void on the left and on the right hand side. So the pit void is about 60 metres deep here. And so what we've done here is we've, we've backfilled the pit, um, brought the natural surface, oh, sorry, brought the ground surface, not natural, brought, brought the ground surface back up to um, being consistent with the natural surface so that we can get a true flow system happening. Um, we've put a geosynthetic clay liner underneath so that we don't lo lose all our water through seepage and then we have our buns as well. And so that allows water to flow through and the downstream environment to get its water that it's adapted to. And then a much smaller scale example, but just an example of how um, all of these little bits and pieces can add up. So there's a catchment up here, it's only 0 0.5 square kilometres. So we have mined out this pit and this green is just showing what the design is. So um, we are going to backfill this pit. Um, we'll be creating a two metre fall along the length of the pit there. And then this will allow the water to flow through. And then um, this section here is hard competent rock. So it'll discharge onto that rock and then um, cascade down into the natural stream. So with creek capture, so the, the risk is that the flood will overtop the buns or whatever the natural higher ground is, and then start to flow down the pit face. Now, if that happens, you get um, very high erosive potential and quite quickly you get head cut, which um, propagates back into the creek thalweg. And then you essentially are capturing the creek. So forever and a day after that occurs, the creek will just flow straight into the pit and then the downstream environment um, will be starved of the water. So obviously that's something that we don't want to occur. And this example here at Albany 23 near the town of Newman, um, we've decided to backfill that pit to make sure that we don't have any risk of creek capture from this adjacent creek, which is called Homestead Creek. And so at the time of this photo, we had backfilled the majority of the pit. Um, you can see the coordinates here if anybody wants to check it out. And um, we're currently up to about here. So we've now backfilled about 90% of the pit and we just have that last little bit to go. One of the choices um, that designers and planners have is around what design event are we going to choose for closure. Um, and so the approach that BHP is, is taking is a risk-based approach. So some of the questions that you need to ask are, what is the impact both on the stream and on the downstream receptor? And then if an event above the design life occurs, you know, what's the impact? Is it just, you're gonna get some minor erosion or some water spreading out over a floodplain that wouldn't normally get water or are you going to get creek capture? And so um, here's an example of a table. So this isn't finalised and it's not agreed with regulators, um, but it's a, it's a step along the way. So if you have a small catchment, say less than 10 square kilometres and environmental sensitivity is low, then potentially you can design just for the one in 100 year event. Um, all the way up to if you have a large creek system and I mean generally large creek systems do have high environmental sensitivity, um, then you should be looking at something a lot more serious like the 10,000 year event. So design event and design life are, are two totally different things um, and that needs to be kept in mind when you're doing these designs. And the, the key point is that there's no point constructing a bund to the elevation of a 10,000 year event if it's just going to be eroded away within 100 years or even faster. And this photo on the right was a real learning for me. So it was never designed to be a permanent bund, but um, it was near one of our ponds and it was constructed with a well graded material, but it wasn't constructed to an engineering specification. There was no moisture control or compaction or testing or anything like that. But you can see it had a bund crest width of about a metre. It was about one metre high. And we had ponding up against it of 100 mils depth. And after a few days of, of that ponding, um, we had a piping failure. So the consequence was, was not very much at all. This is all fresh water and it just flowed through to the next pond. Um, but it was a real learning for me in that um, 
if you don't have a, a well engineered bund, then it's not going to last at all. And here's a few other examples. These are mostly around um, particle size distribution. So all of these were designed to be permanent buns. They haven't performed well for various reasons, mostly around the particle size distribution. So this first one was only six years old at the time of the photo. Um, it was a perfectly formed trapezoidal bund, but the material that we used was dominated by silt. Um, not nearly enough gravel or sand content. And so when it was compacted, it just didn't have that strength and just the water ponding on the top has seeped through and caused a lot of piping. It looks like the rabbits have been in there, but that's just all piping. Um, and obviously that's not gonna last and probably needs to be rebuilt actually. This photo on the right is, um, is a recent example and there were localized pockets of material that we used that were too fine. So we did all of our particle size distribution testing on the material before we went out and um, constructed it and everything passed and met the spec. Um, but it turns out that the, the size of, or the frequency of testing was too infrequent and we had some batches go through that had high clay content. And then when that moisture dried out in the sun, we started to get some cracking. Uh, it's not structural, um, but we do need to keep an eye on it to make sure that it doesn't propagate or cause any erosion. And we actually have changed our specification for testing based on that. Example on the left is sort of the other end of the spectrum. Um, this bund through here, they tried to compact it as best as they could, but you can see it's dominated by cobbles and gravel and there just wasn't enough fine to get a good compaction. And then the photo on the right um, is an embankment, which is in, in excellent condition. So that's 15 years old and it doesn't have, basically doesn't have a grain of sand that's been washed off it. So that's just an example to show that it's definitely possible to build something that's going to last. And um, for those of you in, that are in Europe, you'd be used to seeing all of the work that the Romans did thousands of years ago that's still standing. So it's definitely possible to build things that last a long period of time. We just need to make sure we make the effort. So the, the next design consideration that I'm going to run through is slope. So slopes are, you need to get the slope right to get sediment deposition to occur. And if you get no sediments depositing out, then there's no substrate for vegetation to get their roots into. And there's also no voids between the sediment for soil moisture retention. So this example here is Slims Creek, again at our Yandy mine site. Um, this section was constructed at 0.2%. You can see this arrow here is just trying to show the tongue of alluvial material, which has been dropping out through here. And you can see that there's a lot of vegetation is starting to build up through the creek and um, that's evolving into a nice healthy ecosystem. Um, another location at Yandy, um, the slope now is 0.4%. And you can see there's quite a difference in the material through here. So there's, there's a lot of cobbly material. It's a relatively high energy system, um, but you can see that it's good enough that there's a lot of vegetation starting to establish and, and some trees getting a foothold as well, which is great. Um, what's quite interesting about this is this photo was taken after a relatively big event. And so when you're walking the creeks, what you're seeing really is um, the signature or the, or the thumbprint of the last event. Whereas um, now there's been a lot of smaller events or recently there's been a lot of smaller events. So if you walk this same creek now, it's um, draped in a lot of fine material. So it looks quite different. So we step up to a slope of 0.6% and you can see in here there, there is a little bit of gravelly material that's been deposited, but really not very much. And as a result, there's not much vegetation. There's one tree that's probably found a crack to get its roots into, but um, there's not a lot of life through here and, and that's not a great result. And then we go steeper again, you can see how sensitive it is to slope. So this section is at 0.8%. Even though there's been a recent event, there's no vegetation through here. There's no sediment. Um, you can see that the material that's been left around is, is pretty large diameter and it's just not suitable for re-establishing a healthy creek system. So 
So I mentioned that um, vegetation needs both soil, um, soil and water to be able to thrive. Um, and you can achieve that by having a mix of overblasting of material and also importing alluvial material. Um, so you need a coarse, uh, sorry, you need a mix of coarse material to get the storage for the water, but you also need some fine material to make sure that the tree roots have to work hard to pull that water out so that they don't just pull out all the water very quickly and then all of a sudden get left with a with an empty glass and they've, and they've got no water and they just keel over. So your sediment sizing also needs to be a match to your hydraulic conditions. So there's no point having a lot of really fine material in a high energy environment, but it'll just get washed downstream. And likewise, if you've got really coarse material, um, then your creek is going to be sediment starved. And as soon as it moves into natural conditions, it's going to want to try and pick up sediment and erode away the, um, the natural creek system. So there's a whole bunch of different disciplines that are required. And this example here just shows all of the particle size distribution work that was done. And, um, and from that, we designed this creek system through here. So if you just focus on the creek itself, you can see there's a lot of riparian vegetation establishing in this creek. Um, it's actually a very healthy riparian environment now, quite dense in places. Um, ignore everything on the banks, that all will be reshaped enclosure and and um, and we'll have grasses all through and it'll look a lot neater than what it does now. But the point from this one is that the riparian vegetation is developing really nicely and it's mostly due to the particle size distribution of the material that was in there. So I'm going to move on to the example of a large diversion. So this is Marilana Creek. Uh, it has a catchment area around 1,500 square kilometres. So the design was led by Vizian and the hydrogeology was done by AQ2 um, and Duncan had a big part to play in that. It, there's a large team of technical experts um, from a, a big range of disciplines, including hydrologists, hydraulic modelers, the geomorphs, civil engineers, geotech engineers, the hydrogeologists and ecologists. Um, we completed this in 2018 and it will be there for closure. Um, some of the features that we've got include roughness elements, the use of overblast and imported alluvium, and a mix of incised and anabranching sections. So with the shallow aquifer, um, some of the questions that we needed to ask were, how does the existing shallow aquifer work and how does it connect into the regional aquifer? What are the moisture retention curves of existing materials? What are the long-term hydrographs in the alluvials and how do they react to stream flow? And that's what we're showing over on the right here. So um, this has taken over a couple of years and you can see this zone here is the alluvial material. And you can see that when you get a stream flow event, the, the groundwater uh, reacts and then starts to decay away and then keeps working its way through this trend. So by monitoring that over a long period of time, you can get a feel for how the natural system works. Um, what is the existing eco-hydrology? So what trees do you have there? What's their density and what's their water requirements? You need to analyze the stream flow and drought sequences. Um, how does the soil moisture recharge? So this is the question that we didn't even realize we needed to ask until we got into the project, but your design of the creek is actually quite different if the shallow aquifer can recharge just by just horizontally, um, or does it actually need to flood over and then you get vertical recharge? And then obviously a lot of geomorphology um, goes into this as well. So how's the shallow aquifer uh, going to move? So if the creek's moving all the time and you set up a shallow aquifer in another location, it's not gonna do you much good. So in this case, the shallow aquifer was designed to withstand a six year drought period. Uh, it was a depth of six meters it had three meters of overblasted material that was left in situ. And then we went and pulled a lot of material from the creek section, which was to be bypassed. And we reused that alluvial material in this creek. So this is what it looked like after year one. Um, so it looks like not much has happened and, and it's all very dead, but it's actually, this was the start. So. Actually, it's quite good to keep an eye on this little hill here as a, as a reference point. But you can see a couple of the roughness elements. So we've got these boulder piles 
and then we recovered all of the trees that were cleared as part of this creek and um, we buried them deep into the alluvials and the two of those features were the, our main roughness elements. So you can see we've had some flow events already so we've got material piled up on the upstream side of the boulders and then we're starting to get a little bit of scouring happening around the side so you've already got some localized high flow and low flow zones or high velocity low velocity zones and again around the buried tree trunks um, we've caught some debris which has come down and then you can see that there's a bit of a scour zone through here and then a bit of finer material directly behind the tree. And then after year three, it's really starting to come together. So you can see this is a boulder pile here. We've collected some debris in front of the boulder pile. And then you've got some vegetation, well, quite a lot of vegetation, which is starting to form in the lee of these roughness elements. So again, there's no planting that we've done through here. All this vegetation is just self-seeded and it just reiterates that fact that if you get the physical properties right, then nature will come along and do the rest. And so here's just a close up, you can see that there's a bit of an island that's formed in the lee of those boulders and um, some fine sediment and seeds have dropped out. So this is a section where we had an incised section of the creek. So um, the geomorphology was done to match the natural system. So the creek does go through these sort of gorge-like areas. Um, so in this zone here, that was designated to be high velocity. And um, as you can see, there's no fine sediment and there's no vegetation through here, but that's exactly as per design. And then on the edges, we've got our roughness elements and then we are starting to get vegetation on the edges, which is great. Just another photo showing the same sort of thing, but you can see here, this is that that same little hill. So you can see it's looking quite different to the, when we constructed it four years ago. Now, um, there's quite a lot of life returning. So when we were there, there was, um, a, there was a lot of tadpoles in the water. So um, that was really great to see. Um, there was some localized scour holes around these roughness elements so around the tree trunks and the boulders and the water persists in those for a period of weeks after the stream stops flowing. And that's enough for all these animals to complete their life cycle. So there's a lot of invertebrates, uh, obviously the frogs, um, but there's also uh, some water birds there. So I'd never seen these water birds in the Pilbara before and I looked them up and um, they're a bird called the redneck stint. And uh, they actually fly each year from Siberia across Asia um, down to Northern Australia. Uh, and obviously they could stop anywhere they wanted along that route for a drink and a feed and they chose to stop in our diversion. So that was a, re a really good tick of approval. You can see them there. So what does a four year old river look like? So I'm gonna tab across to the video. Yeah, uh, uh, Ian, well, before you play the uh, the video, uh, there's been tons of questions coming in on the Q&A line. And so I just thought um, uh, just so maybe as you're playing the video, you might be able to address some of the questions that have come in. Um, so if we can just have a quick look at that. And then, um, Duncan, if you wanted to come on as well, because it looks like you've been answering a couple of these questions in the background. Um, I, th I think some of these would then help um, when, when you we're walking through it, you can then make some comments uh, on, on some of the things that, uh, that people have uh, asked about. Now, we did see that some of the attendees um, you know, don't come from a mining background at all. And there was a question about some of the uh, uh, acronyms and abbreviations that we're using, um, OSAs, the uh, overburdened storage areas. Um, uh, Ian, just want to explain real quick what that, uh, what that material is made of. Yeah, sure. And this is probably a, a timely question because you can see them in here. Yeah, so essentially the when, back, yeah. when you, when you mine, um, there's some material that is useful to you and is the ore that you're actually going to process and sell. And then there's other material, which is not useful to you. And you just need to pull that and get that out of the way so that you can get access to the ore. So that waste material, um, or overburden, um, is what gets moved into the overburdened storage areas. And so, uh, it, it's also known as a waste dump. I mean, overburdened storage areas is, is just a nicer way of saying it really, that people may have heard the term waste dump. 
Um, and so in here, um, so th this is our creek diversion, um, but you can see the pits in through here. And then you can see this section through here is material which has been backfilled in through there. So that would be an example of an in-pit overburdened storage area or in-pit OSA. And we can place them externally as well, um, but ideally we place them in pit just to minimize our footprint. Thanks. Uh, the other one was the NPV, which is just the net present value. So that just refers to the, um, you know, the, the value of your, uh, of your resource um, that you can go to, uh, uh, to market with. Um, but uh, one of the other questions here then um, on, uh, you, somebody did ask about the burrowing animals, Ian, <laughs> that you said, uh, okay, that doesn't look like it's from burrowing animals. Did you have any issues out there with burrowing animals? Uh, no, no, we don't. Um, and I think that's just because of the climate that we have there. We, we actually don't have any native burrowing animals that cause us problems. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, so somebody asked about the advantages of the low flow channel. I'll let you, when we see this in here, um, I think then we'll go ahead and have that um, uh, when, when, when we see what, what you're uh, going through and, and looking at the low flow channel, you can talk about some of those advantages there. Uh, but Duncan, there was one question you answered here. Somebody said, oh, well, how do you avoid impacts to the groundwater table when you have a giant pit like right alongside of it? And I saw that there was a, um, a bit of an answer there. Maybe if you want to just repeat that since those watching the YouTube recording won't uh, have access to the text. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the voids that you can see there, I mean, there's, a, there's two or three in the photograph that Ian's got, got shown there at the moment. The voids, the groundwater level around the voids is pulled down by, by dewatering bores uh, during operations, assuming that the floor of the pit is intersecting the regional groundwater level. When the when mining stops, uh, those pumps will be turned off and the groundwater level will recover and it will either recover and form a pit lake uh, in the voids or alternatively it will, it will recover into backfill material if waste rock or other other waste material has been placed into the pits. Um, but largely speaking, that's independent of the land bridges. The question was in relation to, to, to the land bridges in, in interact with the groundwater level. And, um, you know, the, the land bridges are probably only flowing for one or two weeks a year. So largely speaking, they, they, they're functioning independently of the regional groundwater system. Okay, thanks. And um, so somebody asked, uh, again, just on some definitions, the, uh, when we talk about creek capture, that's when the entire creek would end up uh, flowing into the pit because of, uh, you know, maybe it overtops initially and it's just a part of the floodplain that flows in, but at some point creek capture would refer to the condition in which even the low flow channel has been diverted into the pit uh, because it has scoured out enough and had cut back enough toward, uh, toward the creek. Um, then there was one other, well, and again, uh, on these definitions, uh, when we talk about a land bridge, um, Ian, do you want to just define that term, uh, land bridge, and how that's different from just a regular diversion that's through, uh, you know, previous existing ground? Uh, what, what's when we talk about the term land bridge? If you want to give that one a, a better definition. Yeah, sure. So when we talk about land bridges, we're talking about the case where we've had to backfill a pit and then re-establish a flow path over the top of that backfill pit. Um, so you can imagine that's quite an effort if you've got a pit, which is um, generally our pits are 60 to 150 metres deep. Um, and if you have to backfill that back to surface and then re-establish a creek over the top of that and <laughs> make consideration of all the settlement that will occur, um, it, it's a fair effort. Um, and yeah, so we've just got the one example at the moment. Thanks. Okay. Well, that's, that's great. Now let's, let's go ahead and have you then just uh, do the walkthrough. I just wanted to cover a couple of those questions first, some of the definitions so that as we're walking through this, um, then you can point some things out uh, Then we'll come back on after you're done with the uh, fly through and address some of the other questions. Lots of great questions coming in. Keep them coming from the audience. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Craig. So this video was actually taken from downstream to upstream. I would have much preferred if it was taken from upstream to downstream so you can move with the water. Um, but nonetheless, this is the very downstream end of our diversion here. And so this section here is the natural creek system. Uh, the natural creek system used to run in this direction here. Um, you can see that we've extended our mine through here. So we've accessed the ore, which was underneath that creek system. You can see as well that we have a bund through here to make sure that when the creek flows, it's not um, backwatering back into our pit and flooding our pit. So straight away, um, 
there's a few features that you can see here. Um, something which I found quite interesting is that there's a bunch of logs which have deposited through here. You can see about 10 different logs. And my take on that is this section through here has got relatively high energy and it carries those logs along. And then it hits this transition zone where we've widened and there's, there's less energy, there's less ability to carry those logs and all those logs are getting deposited out. Um, the other thing that you'll see, and I'll just start play, is you can see the low flow channel that we constructed through here. And you can see the floodplains on both sides. So the diversion is this full width here. That's all part of the active diversion that we've constructed. It's about 200 meters wide. It has capacity for a flow of around 6,000 cubic meters a second. Um, and in through here, you can see a lot of the roughness elements. So you can see these boulder piles that we've placed. You can see the trees which have been buried in and the vast majority of the trees are still in place, which is great. Um, and you can see the riparian vegetation starting to form. So generally the trees are establishing on the edge of the low flow channel. And then we've got um, a lot of shrubs which are establishing in the floodplain um, and a lot of grasses as well. There's, there's not a lot of bare space so most of the area has been colonized now, which is brilliant. Um, and you do get these sections like in here where you've got really dense riparian vegetation forming. Um, it'd be really interesting to see whether all of those trees make it to maturity or not. Um, there'll be a lot of competition for water because you don't normally get trees that dense when they're mature. Um, but it's great to see them all establishing. I've paused here because at this point, we've got three tributaries which come into the main creek. Um, for those tributaries, we cut them back at one vertical to five horizontal. Um, we knew that that wouldn't be a stable slope, but we were okay with that in that that erosion of material that we're going to get down and that we have already seen. Down into the main creek channel is a really good source of sediment. So the creek, um, isn't going to be sediment starved and also provide some geomorphological diversity in the creek. Um, and you can see this one that we're coming up to, it's formed really quite a large delta already given it's only been four years. So we're moving into one of the inside sections and one of the features that we had was we had um, just a single rock bar. And the idea behind the rock bar was to take advantage of a dolerite dike that we had, which is a really erosion resistant section of rock. And the concern that we had was if we had a very large event early on in the, on, in the life of the creek, that you would get these high velocities because you don't have the trees established yet. So you, your roughness is quite low. And the risk was that that would have eroded away a lot of our alluvial material that we, went to so much effort to remove and place in the creek. So this section through here, it's not so obvious, but there's not much vegetation in there, is essentially exposed rock. And so that um, is a grade control feature for us. And it also um, serves the purpose of stopping any water which is caught in that shallow alluvial aquifer behind it from draining out. Move a bit quickly through here. So just in here, we're we're moving into the natural creek system. Obviously the, the trees are mature and, and denser. It looks very healthy. And then there were two sections to the, the diversion. So this is the second section of the diversion. Um, similar low flow channel and up to 200 meter wide floodplain. Um, interesting, the geomorphology is getting started through here. So you can see a bit of a bar forming in through there and quite a dense patch of trees in through here. This is that little hill that we saw in some of the still photos. And then we move into an incised section. That's that same section that I had the still photo from, although the photo was from the other angle. You can see vegetation on the edges here, um, but as per the design, no vegetation really in the middle. And then at the start, we've got quite good vegetation starting to form. You know, all these trees will continue growing and, and form a canopy over time. 
And then this is now the upstream end of the diversion um, back into the natural system. So that's the flyover uh, and that's really the end of my talk. So Craig, I'll hand back to you to guide us through any questions. That sounds good. All right. Um, and there have been quite a few. Thank you to those um, who have been uh, uh, asking the questions and thanks especially to Duncan, who's been frantically answering some of the background. <laughs> Ian, I'll give you a chance then uh, while Duncan's answering a couple of these uh, to go through on that uh, on the Q&A line and then just see if there's any you want to highlight. Um, I don't, there's at least 20 unanswered questions at the moment, um, uh, in addition to the ones that Duncan's already answered. So we probably won't get through all of them. But uh, if you want to just uh, maybe start with the ones that have been upvoted the most and then uh, and any others that jump out at you uh, while we're talking here in the background. Uh, Duncan, do you, uh, do you want to just uh, pick a couple of the ones that, uh, that you've answered in the background um, and maybe share some of your thoughts about the ones that we were going to uh, answer live here? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of minutes to just uh, you know, express some of the things that you had uh, put in writing already. Sure. Uh, let me just call up the unsaid section. Um, so there was a good question on uh, on how long does it take for groundwater levels to recover? And um, the reality is that hasn't been measured in any of the Pilbara systems yet. The only pit that's actually been closed in the Pilbara is the Goldsworthy pit and it is still recovering. Um, and so we only have modeled estimates. We don't have measured, uh, um, you know, we don't have measured results, uh, but the modeling suggests that it's going to take many tens of years, if not hundreds of years for most of the groundwater systems where there's been substantial dewatering uh, to actually recover. That then led into another question about the connection between a recovering groundwater system and uh, a shallow eco-hydrological environment and groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, and in the case of the Andy that Dean's been talking about, the intent as far as possible has been to separate the creek shallow groundwater system and eco-hydrological environment from the regional groundwater system that's hosted in the, uh, in the old ore deposits uh, such that the creek can can retain uh, vegetation on a shallow groundwater level, even though the regional system has been dewatered. Um, just following on from that, it's also the case that not all of the species, not all the riparian tree species that we're um, looking to encourage in this particular case. It's not the case that all of those require groundwater level. Uh, they're all riparian, so they require frequent, uh, you know, they require mesic conditions and frequent soil water replenishment but they don't necessarily require shallow groundwater to uh, to recover or establish. Excellent. Well, thanks. Um, so with that, uh, Ian, actually, while, while you're gathering some of the things from there, let me just, I'm going to share my screen and just uh, uh, pass along a few uh, resources here. Um, which we can, we can add to. So I've set up this uh, accompanying webpage, hydroschool.org slash mining. And I've posted a few things that I had uh, on my hard drive here, but I would like to add some of the things that uh, some people have been contributing uh, through the Q&A line and some of the other presenters um, have some additional resources. Uh, that way, when people watch this video on YouTube, you know, a year or two years from now, we continue to, uh, to add some things to this that they can reference. So I'll put the recording of it uh, here. We've got some previous webinars that uh, we've had on the Australian Water School channel here, uh, Managed Aquifer Recharge for Mining, uh, we might do a little more of that. We've got the PDF of this presentation, uh, a bunch of papers here um, that talk about uh, some of them in the Pilbara uh, for creek realignments, uh, diversions, um, some uh, thoughts about uh, the, you know, designing for a one in a hundred uh, AEP event, which, uh, you know, sometimes uh, people think it might have a hundred year life just because it's got a one in a hundred uh, chance, uh, you know, it's been protected against the one in a hundred event. Uh, and there's some thoughts here about about uh, how that can be a bit of a fallacy and uh, give you some false senses of security. Um, got a few more papers on riprap uh, and scour protection on mine sites. Um, some of these uh, papers were done together with uh, Rio Tinto and some with Fortescue uh, Metals Group here in uh, WA. So that's just something that we have in the background. Um, I may show a couple of uh, additional uh, figures um, while we're answering questions that might demonstrate some of the topics uh, th that uh, that we're addressing here, uh, but Ian, uh, over to you. Uh, any, uh, you know, j just pick a couple of those questions that uh, yeah, sure. you yeah, see there. If you can go ahead, great with that. questions here. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them uh, was a question around weeds versus native for that uh, the plant growth. So they're actually they're all native materials. 
uh, native vegetation. We don't have any weeds through there, which is awesome. Um, there's a question around fish passage. So um, whether there's any particular structures to enable fish to get through. So the, the whole creek has been designed to be a match essentially to the natural creek system. So there's no need for any dedicated fish passages. The slopes are, I mean, the slope of the diversion is about 0.2%, although it varies quite a bit depending on what we're trying to achieve in each reach. Um, but that's totally fine for fish to migrate back and forth. Um, there's a question around the sinuosity of the low flow channel. So again, we just tried to match the natural system as best we could. Um, so we weren't aiming for a lot of meanders. It was just a match to what we've seen in the natural system. There was a question around the design event. So it was designed for the one in 10,000 year event. So uh, it's going to be there for closure. And so we needed to design for a very large event. Um, there's also a question around the land bridges. Um, that the geomorph on the land bridge um, didn't look right. And that is that is spot on. So the land bridges, we're trying to do something different with the land bridges. We're actually not trying to recreate a natural system through the land bridges because we don't want vegetation to establish there because you get, get the risk that trees will establish and their roots will puncture, puncture the liner um, and then the trees will die and rot and then you get a hole through the liner. So, we're deliberately not encouraging vegetation on the land bridge and it's really just trying to get water from one side to the other so that the rest of the environment can get that water that it needs. Um, there's also a question on the settlement of the land bridge. Um, we have seen settlement up to 0.6 of a metre on that land bridge. Um, it is still settling. We assumed that it would settle. It's, it's settled a bit more than what we expected, to be honest, um, but that is all manageable. Um, what else was there? Um, while you talk about that, I've just got a few uh, images here. You know, when we talk about trying to protect a uh, a, a mining pit or some area uh, from, uh, you know, w using a, a bund or a levee, um, you know, there are many different ways that that could fail. And just because you've protected something against the overtopping, um, you know, uh, some, some sort of overtopping failure uh, doesn't mean like in Ian's example where you just had a little bit of water up against it that is not going to fail in some other way including you know vegetation growing on it uh, you walk away after closure and a tree grows on it and blows over and you've punched a, a, a hole in your levy um, so yeah back, back over to you Ian. if there was any others you wanted yeah to... there's a good question here about um, do you do pre and post sediment transport analysis comparing natural versus the diversion um, so yeah we do and and that was that's one of the key ways that we can look at the success of the diversion so we have a network of SONs which are installed, um, so instruments which are installed in the creek system, which are continuously monitoring for turbidity um, as a proxy for suspended solid coming through. And we've developed a relationship with Cray's help actually between turbidity and suspended solids at this site. And so we had five years of background data before we started um, messing around in the creek. And we saw, as you'd expect, that the first couple of years, there was a big spike in turbidity and confirmed by the sampling for suspended solids that we did. But over the last few years, it started to settle down towards the natural system and, and that's faster than what we expected it would take. Uh, so that's really promising as well. Excellent. So one of the uh, questions that came in here, um, you know, again, on what magnitude event, uh, well, that one in particular, what's the magnitude event that that one uh, was designed for? Then maybe we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, options on uh, what level to design something for. Yeah, so this one was designed for the 10,000 year event, Cray. Okay, so when we talk about a one in 10,000, again, there's um, a few of these papers that uh, we've got in the background um, on that, uh, that accompanying website that talk about, you know, the uh, not making the mistake of thinking that something that is designed to accommodate a 10,000 year event is going to have a 10,000 year duration and something that's designed for the PMF is going to last forever. Um, there are other uh, fail, failure mechanisms. And, um, you know, and again, these the scale that you see on some of these things, I might pull up um, the accompanying slide 
slides for a paper um, that uh, that we've got on that website that's um, a, a diversion design and this was a few years back um, a, a paper that was put together you can see the uh, the links to this one uh, on that website but I wanted to just go through and show on this uh, particular diversion um, this was one that uh, Rio Tinto was involved in and um, the the scale of some of these things when you look at the mining pit versus the um, uh, uh, versus the creek channel. So we have this big creek channel system, which you saw in some of those slides I was just flipping through quickly. Uh, but when that mining pit is in place, you can see this floodplain is going to get reduced uh, much, uh, you know, much uh, narrower width than it was before, which is going to increase the velocities and you've got to protect the levee. Um, and so you can, uh, and, uh, you know, protect it from overtopping, from scour, from erosion. Um, and, uh, but what I wanted to show here then was the scale of this. This is in a longitudinal profile. So here's the water depth in a massive event. That's a PMF event. And there's the size of the mining pit. So compare the depth of the PMF uh, to the mining pit itself. And then in cross-section view, this is looking downstream. Here's the river system. And we're doing geomorphology and everything on this river system. And when we talk about creek capture, that would be, you know, if there was a failure of this levee and the creek ended up in here, you can see some of the uh, the, the volumes in, involved uh, in, in some of these things. And what we're trying to prevent you know, is uh, something like this, which was a real scenario here in uh, Western Australia uh, a few years back, and the kind of head cuts that might then force the entire channel uh, to uh, drain into a pit. And when you think about, you know, uh, Duncan was talking about the life uh, of recovery, you know, for the drawdown to rebound um, after mining is completed. If you look at the sediment transport and the geomorphology of a creek system, um, the taking the bed load away from the creek, it would take eons of time sometimes for that bed load to fill in the uh, mining pit and get to another equilibrium uh, downstream. So when we're talking about some of these things here, I wanted to also then plug a webinar that's coming up in about two months time where we're, it's called the stage zero approach to geomorphic design. And that's something where, um, you know, we try to look at the channels and uh, what they were looking like. And I think um, on, on some of Ian's slides, um, you could see uh, that the, the creek had plenty of room to move around. And uh, Dr. Colin Thorne and some others who have been uh, big advocates of some of these uh, concepts of allowing the creek to have uh, room to move uh, when you're done with it um, and not trying to constrain or confine it uh, is a principle that's been applied in some of these closure designs as well uh, for the mining industry. So tune into that one. That'll be coming up in uh, uh, in in De uh, sorry in, in May. I think early May. Um, we'll have a webinar on that if you're interested in geomorphic. Uh, designs. So I'll stop my share from there and maybe we can have some additional resources while we're talking, have just a few minutes to go and we, we'll, we'll uh, address a couple more questions. But in the background, if we can have some of the water school uh, slides on some of the resources that are coming up, uh, then I'll turn it back over to Duncan uh, for a couple minutes. We still got another 20 questions now that have been unanswered. Uh, we'll frantically try and answer those as quick as we can. Uh, Duncan, any that you wanted to highlight? Um, there's no more questions that really fall within my uh, my basket, but uh, there's one thing that it, it, I think it's important that Ian touched on, and that's the idea of replenishment of soil moisture to uh, encourage the vegetation to grow. Uh, and it is the case that not all of the um, you know the riparian vegetation requires permanent access to groundwater, or indeed any access to groundwater, but it does require frequent soil moisture replenishment. And obviously, when a material is unsaturated, the uh, you know water, the hydraulic conductivity is not very high. So the importance of designing the creek to overtop fairly fairly frequently onto its near benches and floodplains uh, to get that groundwater to get that soil moisture replenishment going uh, becomes really quite important. Don't expect water to move laterally. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Ian, um, what uh, we've got about uh, maybe two minutes to go here. Um, Give us a couple of quick responses to some of the ones that uh, you've seen here, and, and then we'll uh, have you both give some closing remarks. Yeah, Craig, I think I've answered most of the questions that were uh, succinct answers were possible. <laughs> some of the questions <laughs> yes. were, were good questions, but but really merit a ten minute discussion as opposed to you know a thirty second answer. So. Um, yeah, I think I'll let, leave the we'll, Q and A there, Craig. Well, okay. Well, we'll leave it at that then. And um, yeah, if you both could um, uh, give us some closing remarks here in a minute. But uh, 
we realize we, you know, we call this mine water management, and we expect this to be, you know, part one in a series of mine water management uh, discussions. This was one that focused on, you know, external flow heading toward a mine site and how you might divert it around there. There are other a aspects and issues that involve uh, direct runoff and rainfall and runoff on the site itself. All of those topics that you saw in the quiz, or the poll question in the beginning, um, are things we could cover. We can, uh, you know, the, the papers that I've uh, listed here are from the International Mine Water Association conference, where you have, you know, 40 or 50 papers all about mine water uh, impacts and mine water implications and things like that. What do you want to see more of? Give us your feedback. Um, fill out that form in the end. Uh, let us know. We can do courses on some of these uh, topics if that's of uh, of use um, to the industry, um, or we can have some dedicated webinar sessions, um, in particular on some of the issues that uh, Duncan has addressed here on groundwater. So we can show you some examples of that. Um, thanks to those um, who have uh, tuned in in the background and put some questions forward. Uh, we've got some people in attendance there who are actually going to be teaching some of the uh, GMORF courses. Uh, shout out to Andy Markham here, who's uh, got a couple questions there in the in the uh, post. Um, you can uh, uh, sign up for uh, some of these on-demand courses and get a little more into the geomorphology uh, that uh, Ian has hinted to. So with that, let's have uh, Duncan give some closing remarks, and then we'll let uh, Ian bring it home. Duncan, over to you. Um, I, th I think uh, what Ian's, Ian's shown today, it's a really good example, particularly where, where a diversion is is a long-term, it's not operational, it's long-term, it's post-closure. i uh, shown the integration of groundwater, surface water, soil moisture to encourage something that becomes ecologically sustainable over the long term with the natural regrowth of, uh, of, a, of a riparian ecosystem, how that's all possible. Thanks. Yeah, it's multifaceted. If uh, that, if that's the, the main take-home message that I get from this, uh, many different disciplines involved in uh, successfully pulling something like this off. Ian, take it home for us. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Yeah, along a similar line of thinking. If you've got a simple diversion around the edge of a pit, then uh, as a water engineer, you can just design that by yourself. And I think the temptation is for engineers to think that they can do everything, and to um to try and design something like this, you need a big dose of humility up front to, to know your limitations and to know that you need to go and speak to a whole bunch of other experts from other fields. And when you work together, it can be really satisfying because you learn a lot from the other disciplines and then um, it, you can all tie together and you can get a great result. Excellent. Well, thanks so much uh, to our presenters and panelists coming on board. Um, we look forward to uh, future interactions with you, the attendees. Uh, thanks for spending this time with us. Uh, give us your feedback, and we look forward to uh, seeing you again on a future webinar for the Australian Water School. Thanks.